Kia ora It is my pl pleasure to be here at this conference to see the Biological Heritage Challenge really get up and started. Um, before I get into the topic of urban restoration, I just wanted to tip my hat to congratulate all of the people who came before because I'm not going to tell a story which is, well, I'm going to tell a story which could not have happened without the previous work. So we heard yesterday Nicola mentioned Richard Henry, there's people like Don Merton, there's Alan Saunders in Mainland Islands, there's all sorts of names out there that we need to remember when we start talking about this next phase that I believe is becoming the new frontier, urban ecology. So we obviously live in an increasingly urban world and the predictions are that by 2050, 64% of people in, on the globe will live in urban centres. And so clearly urban living is, a, is an important component of ecology. So, and also the fact that not only do people live there, but the impacts of cities, you know, the use of resource of cities is enormous and impacts on surrounding landscapes, whole nations, and in fact the whole globe. Some statistics there that verify that. And also the fact that Many of us are living beyond our means. We're using more resource than the planet can actually provide under current scenarios. And um, Mahatma Gandhi had a comment to make on that. My crazy and ambitious idea is about what if, what if actually cities were viewed not as the problem, but as the solution. And I'm referring mainly in my talk, of course, to bringing back biodiversity, but there are many other benefits to what I'm proposing, multiple benefits. I'll be focusing on nature, native plants and animals. I'll hardly touch on green space in the broad sense, and I certainly won't be talking about natural capital, but they're all part of this picture. What is urban ecology? Well, it is a new and emerging discipline, um, probably only 20 years old, really. Um, McDonnell and Fors recently published a, re a review which talked about the history of urban ecology, if you're interested. And it's really about the recognition of including humans in the ecosystem, not something apart and separate from it, about the processes around urbanisation, about the need to understand coupled human and ecological systems, socio-political and ecological systems coupled together and how they might work together for humans to continue to exist. And then that higher lofty goal of how can we use this to become more sustainable, both within our cities and globally. Just reflecting then on New Zealand, of course, 87% of us do live in towns and cities, and our towns and cities are located mostly on the coast, with a couple of notable exceptions. The city I come from, of course, Hamilton, and and Rotorua, and they are entirely focused on the areas of greatest ecosystem depletion and degradation. They are the places that were the most biodiverse and biodiversity rich. And so, you know, a solution focused on cities has that potential to make a big difference. Just some statistics about those 20 urban centres. Nationally, you know, actually, Calling them even cities is probably a stretch. Internationally, do they really qualify as cities? Low density towns, really, I suspect. Quite small, low density populations. Uh, mean urban core across the whole of New Zealand, only about 4,000 hectares for an urban centre. And the statistic I want to focus on for my talk is the last one here. In the built up matrix of New Zealand cities, ranging between less than 1% to 8.5% of native vegetation cover, compared to international figures where some cities have figures as high as 30 and 40%. In 2007, we made a bit of an attempt to get a handle on how that biodiversity was distributed using vegetation cover as a surrogate and the land cover database, and some algorithms that compared like with like. We all know that all cities in New Zealand have different administrative structures, and one city is not like another city. We've tried to correct for that in these curves. How is that native cover distributed from the centre of the city to the outer peripheries of the city? And we showed that there were a number of different curve types for New Zealand cities. We're sitting in a C-type city at the moment, 
Um, Wellington and Dunedin share that same curve shape. Um, the, the curve shape that I'm going to concentrate on my talk in, of course, is the red line, the flat line curve of cities like Hamilton, where I come from, Hastings and Napier, because those are the places where I think we can make the, different, the biggest difference in bringing back nature into cities. And my other crazy and ambitious idea, and I know it's crazy and I know it's ambitious because I've been told so already on multiple occasions by local body politicians, would be why couldn't we have in the built up matrix of a city around 10% of native cover and then that could really do something for that curve shape and the survival of biodiversity across the urban zone, the peri-urban zone and reconnect it with the wider landscape. So why 10%? Well, you know, I've I can't say I've done any personal research on this topic, but I know of, of, of a whole lot of research that does talk about how we lose species more rapidly when we get down to that threshold of about 10%. And recently in the New Zealand Journal of Ecology, there was a very nice paper published which analysed bird um, communities across the landscape and showed the significance of keeping the area of habitat above 5 to 10%. So although my threshold, my crazy goal, um, is semi-arbitrary, I do believe it has some science sitting behind it. And of course, the most notable is the work of Hansky, who showed um, these indices of fragmentation and that rapid decline in species number once you get below the 10% threshold. So now coming to my case study, I, where, where I've done most of my work, obviously, the Hamilton context and the Waikato you know, a city with less than 2% indigenous vegetation in a wider Hamilton basin where there is only 1.6% of indigenous vegetation left. And some people, of course, have referred to this as a biodiversity desert. Now, there are really good reasons why things are missing from cities with this curb type. It's essentially because people have been extremely systematic and efficient at removing indigenous biodiversity. And I would ha hazard the guess that it wasn't just by accident either, that in some cases it was highly deliberate and it was a view, a world view, which insisted that we should put in place the organisms that came from our European home countries. And even today, when I wander around the Hamilton landscape, I can still see examples of this, this loss, this this removal of indigenous. I just wanted to refer also to what it was like when the subdivisions were first developed in Hamilton. You know, this was farming land first, grazed land, and again, that caused the complete loss often of the indigenous components. So what we have left in Hamilton City, 67 key sites, I'm talking about native vegetation now, mean area, 1.1 hectares, and I've got on there that the images of the two most important patches in Hamilton City, 5.2 hectares of Claudelands Bush, or to Papa Nui as its proper name, and then the other small fragment, just over one hectare on the edge of the Waikato River, Hammond Bush. And of course, restoration of these patches is well known in the literature. We know what to do. It's removing weeds and pests, it's buffering them, it's trying to expand them or connect them. But the point that I want to make is that in cities like Hamilton, Napier, Hastings and Christchurch, restoration of extant patches is not good enough. We need to expand the habitat. And I, be, I will be promoting the concept in my talk of the significance of habitat restoration and not just pest control. Reconstruction then is about moving beyond the older approach of what was called revegetation, which is what most of us did 30 or 40 years ago. It's moving into the notion of ecosystem restoration, thinking about full assemblages and species occupancies and building habitat for all components of ecosystems, not just bringing back birds. I tend to use a, national, a natural successional framework for this work because I'm rooted in ecology based on understanding natural disturbance, in particular volcanic eruption, and I learned for 20 years what you needed to do 
to bring back a good crop of native plants in a place that had been completely obliterated. I think it's very parallel with what you need to do in urban systems. And I've taken up the challenge of Tony Bradshaw, you know, the original re restoration ecologist, if you like, the ultimate challenge for ecologists is how do you reconstruct ecosystems? So you will be hearing a lot about reconstruction in my talk. And I try to link the natural successional processes, the framework of natural succession and recovery to restoration and reconstruction. And I'll be telling a bit of a story in some of the science I show you shortly on how you can use the successional framework using a chronosequence approach, which I also picked up from the work that I did in volcanoes, and um, how you can use that to understand the constraints and opportunities of building habitat understanding the, the environmental drivers that limit you as well. So in Hamilton, it's mainly around reconstruction and restoration in our Hamilton gullies. Mangakau Tukutuku, a good example there, named after the tree fuchsia that was once abundant there, the Kau Tukutuku. And most Hamilton gullies until recently have been heavily dominated by what some scientists want to call novel ecosystems. We heard a few people yesterday talking about novel ecosystems. My view on novel ecosystems is they need to be got rid of and replaced with indigenous dominated ecosystems. So even when they are dominated by grey willow, grey willow, of course, they still have some important bird species in them. Ruru, the moorpork is one but they do not provide the services for that wider range of native birds that we would want to bring back, particularly the nectar feeding birds. And so the target ecosystem for many Hamilton gullies is a forest dominated by kahakatea, pukatea and swamp myri, the hidden gem swamp myri that many South Island people won't know about, swamp myri, the great ecological engineer of a Hamilton gully. So we've been doing it for a while, and these are just some shots to show you what it looks like after you've been working at it. And of course the question is, is it restored? Is it restored after seven years? Well here on the left, dominated by Carrick sedges, a wetland dominated by natives. And on the right, in our own backyard, Bev and Mai's backyard, our 20 year reconstruction of a Kahikatea swamp forest. Well, you know, there are people who've been doing it way longer than me. And in Seeley's Gully in Hamilton, A.J. Seeley started it way back before, 40 years ago. And on the Ecological Society field trip, November of last year, the consensus from this assembled group of ecologists was, it's pretty close to being restored. So I, I, I take that as, as evidence in support of this approach. Elsewhere in Hamilton, we're operating another project, the project known as Waifakariki Natural Heritage Park a 60 hectare block up by the Hamilton Zoo where we are taking the reconstruction approach to its ultimate. We started with the peat lake and grazing pasture. We've identified our target ecosystems as on the map here and we are going for it. Now, how far are we going for it? Well, 2004 the first trees were planted and here's the, the Google Earth view of progress over this period starting at zero hectares and by 2016 up to 31 hectares. And most of the work is done by volunteer labour. This is about an engaged and committed community, unlike the one that we were told we had yesterday. We do have across New Zealand multiple engaged and committed communities who want to do this work, including the killing of the pests. So, We've been doing the science to underpin these processes in Hamilton City, and I'm just going to rip through, and I'm going to have to rip through, obviously I'm running out of time already, some of the examples of the work that we've done to underpin our understanding of how restoration planting can be the device of habitat restoration. And these are just some of the topics that I'm going to cover off now from some of the work that we've done. So I was interested in Richard's filters because the same applies to the flora, the same applies to our extant flora. What you have in the city is a subset of what's in the surrounds and there are often good reasons for it. But one of the reasons you can shift and reverse is the one where there has been systematic removal by human beings, by getting human beings to put them back. And so the total flora of the Hamilton Ecological District, 343 vascular species, and in the city currently around 195 vascular species. So we've got a bit of material to work with 
in the peri-urban zone there. And not only that, when people start doing restoration planting, they use a further subset of what's available. They use the tried and true, the ones that the infrastructure currently has, without thinking about the full range and potential of the plants out there and how you might bring them into the system to bring greater resilience than what we currently have. So you can see the key statistic there is that in planted understory is 26% of the reference site in the rural zone. And there is no good reason why the other plants can't be brought back into the system, as I hope to show you shortly. So some of the results of using a chrono sequence approach Species richness in three ages. Yes, we can show that native plant richness increases with time after the restoration planting. But we can also see in that graph there the, the arrival of the odd exotic vine, which is a bit of a problem. But we can also see the arrival of native epiphytes without any assistance by any restoration planting. When the trees get big enough, some of the epiphytes can begin to colonise. Taking the Waifakariki example, one of the things that we've learned is that it's often, often e easier to start a reconstruction and bring back natives and take control of the site than it is to use an extant patch which is weed infested. That's even harder to do than to reconstruct a new habitat. And the graph here is just simply showing the loss, the reduction in all of those herbaceous pasture weeds as canopy closure is achieved and then consequent to that, the way that natives will start regenerating themselves from the plants that you've planted on the site. And the recognition that native plants become reproductively mature way sooner than we would ever have thought. Seven years, six years, kakatiya producing good viable seed. The other part of the equation is understanding the seed bank, the seed rain, and the seed production, the maturation rates of the plants that you're working with. And this multi-dimensional scaling ordination is, is getting at that. I haven't got time to talk about the detail, but I just want you to focus on that arrow there, because this is the problem you're up against. The arrow shows that when you're talking about the extant vegetation, much higher percentage of natives. If you're talking about the seed rain, way less. If you're talking about the seed bank, even less than that. And so the thing you're up against is how do you shift the probabilities and the balance in the seed bank and the seed rain by having your restoration plantings on site for long enough to start to influence that. And there is evidence already from some of our work that the seed rain in particular can be shifted reasonably fast compared to the seed bank. And within 20 years, you start to see a shift. The other thing is, of course, I'm not completely dismissing the role of predators. Predators not only affect birds, they affect plants. And the same predators, the rats and the mice. So here's a little trial that we did to try and understand what you need to do about achieving low enough predator numbers to ensure germination and establishment of key late successional tree species, in particular the tawa. And you can see that significant loss, 58% against when you put them in a protective cage, 4%. And what, are, what some techniques you could try to try and beat the predator? Well, one simple technique is to take the flesh off the fruit and even possibly coat it with clay. And by doing that, you can improve the opportunity only 35% loss to predation compared to the baseline. So then, you know, again, trying to think about what are the thresholds to how long do you have to do it and what is the threshold for achieving success? This is a, a predictive model we recently published in Ecological Applications, which shows, again, using a chrono sequence approach using restoration planting, the critical threshold of about 20 years when the stabilisation occurs in the humidity level within the forest. And that provides you with enormous opportunities for enhancement planting, enrichment planting, and is the key predictor of epiphyte richness. Also, if you do enrichment planting, 
knowing where to do it at what stage and under what canopy composition. This was a little experiment which shows that if you have too much manica in your canopy, it will depress the result. It will, not, it will not release and allow the plants to come through in the way as if you compare it with a nice mixed canopy restoration planting. And then, of course, that perennial problem of tr Tradescantia and, you know, the comparative of, you know, how much time have you got, how much labour have you got to get out there and do the weeding and um, all of that stuff. Well, we've shown basically using some experiments that you can get a better growth rate from tower by ignoring the Tradescantia. As long as you plant the tower at least one metre tall and get it in there, because it's shade tolerant, you can start developing that understory layer and eventually have the tower come up through the understory and reach the canopy. And the last one, example from our research, although it's not been published yet, this is the one st still sitting in the top drawer, you can bring in some of the really special plants that have been excluded from the city environment because of their isolation from seed source by actually bringing the plants in and putting them back up in the trees. So these are the specialised nest epiphytes, Tafari caro on the left, Petosporum cornifolium, and on the right, Grisolinia lucida. And we've got some pretty good data to show that you can bring them back in. The only thing you need is a decent sized tree. So, not putting down the predator control at all, just making the point that it's the combination which is critical if we're really going to bring back native ecosystems, not just native birds and not just particular native plants. And the Hamilton Halo project, which was funded by Waikato Regional Council and dealt to the peri-urban zone in a 15 kilometre radius around Hamilton City, caused that step change, that tipping point, if you like, which brought back the Tui to Hamilton City after an absence of about 120 years. The perverse result, though, of the focus on the bird also needs to be watched out for. Councillors then say, oh, we've done it. We've, we've achieved it. We've got the Tui. Hell, man, you've got a lot more to do yet. And actually, by doing this and doing the birds alone, you have forgotten all other components of the ecosystem, despite what Jan Wright said the other day. It's not absolutely directly predictable that if you bring back the birds, you'll get everything else. So, different solutions for different cities. Hamilton City, our approach then is a combination of restoration of small patches, reconstruction, linking corridors, connecting to the Waikato River. And um, we, our goal, you know, the 10% goal, if we do all of these things, we'll be knocking on the door of New Plymouth City, which currently holds the record at about 8.6%. Won't be long, we're catching them up. I know the next speaker's gonna tell us how they're gonna go even further ahead. So, we know the constraints for returning nature back into cities. Uh, and the, just the one example in that picture there, that peakiness of the gully stream and how we have to deal with that if, if the subdividers haven't thought about impervious service. All of those things which constrain us, but more important, the unique opportunities which are presented by the urban environment, the lack of grazing animals, the less common uh, occurrence of some predators like stoats and weasels we heard the other day, and the opportunity to bring that coordinated approach, the coordinated interagency action, and the convergence of disciplines and capability that can occur within a city. So um, future needs, well, we've got a new environment roadmap. Somebody referred to it the other day. I was very disappointed when they relegated the theme to a sub-theme. They missed the opportunity. I'll be on there knocking on their door. We've been very lucky when I say we, a group of us from Otago University, from Victoria University, from Landcare Research in Waikato, have recently been funded a new urban ecology program called People, Cities and Nature, which we have aligned with the National Science Challenge Biological Heritage because that's where it fits, and also aligned it with the other one on building better homes. We are going to attempt that next shift of interdisciplinary breadth and also try to close that gap between restoration practice and restoration theory. And this is what the structure of our program looks like. It's got 
you guessed it, some more restoration planning stuff for me in there, but also all of these other important topics like lizards, uh, predator profiles, Maori approaches to cultural values in restoration, green space with Yolanda and um, Claire, who are both at the conference here, and cross-sectoral alliances, the involvement of businesses, Eva Collins. So this is what we've got ahead of us in the ne near future, and I'll just leave you to read the last slide because this is what I really do think. Thank you. across New Zealand, um, have you thought about doing an equivalent characterisation based on predator control in cities and towns around New Zealand? Yeah, I've thought about lots of things, but you know, it's, it's, about, it's about time and money, Roger. And um, absolutely, I, I, take, I take your point and I think there's many other possible analyses like that that we should be doing to get a better grasp on what's going on. That other diagram was done a long time ago and it was done at the very early stages of thinking and there's a lot more to do. There was one over here. Um, so given Auckland is by far the largest um, mm. city in New Zealand, yep. do you think urban research should be focused in um, that area? Well, my, my tendency is to think and we sort of, when we developed the program here, we did think that the people who need this the most are the people of that particular curve type, the flat line curve. Having said that, you know, there are many other places that should not be resting on their laurels. Now, Auckland actually has got a fantastic network of urban, you know, reserves already, but the question is, have they maximised the opportunities to build corridors, linkages? They have projects like Twin Streams that have made an effort in that area. But I think every city in New Zealand still has the issue of if they were going to adopt the crazy ambitious idea, they've still got some work to do in retrofitting in built up areas to bring back the unique components, the things that give us our New Zealand identity, our native biota, plants and animals and insects and everything else. Bruce, uh, I really like your, um, you know, your, your vision for what Hamilton could be um, in, in its uh, terrestrial environment, but the thing I fear is what's happening in the aquatic environment with a lot of rapid infill. So we've got, got a lot of eight, eight sections which were half grass or whatever, and now you know, they're, they're coming up so that they're almost 100% impervious surface and yep. their stormwater is going to one place. Yep. Um, you know, do you have a sort of any kind of advice as to how we might engage to try and get councils to live up to their, their, their responsibilities in doing some decent management of that stormwater? Yeah, well, look, um, you're best to answer that question than me, Brendan, but um, I know that there are some simple things that can be done and should be done, and, you know, fish passes and all the rest are, are obvious solutions to some of this problem. And, Sorry that I concentrated on terrestrial, but you know, I had 30 minutes and I would have loved to have told you about aquatic, terrestrial and everything in between. But you know, the same sort of principles apply. It's a question of you understanding your system, what its constraints and opportunities are, and what you can do to bring back the freshwater component. And of course, Hamilton gullies are essentially riparian zones with a bit of dry land on either side. And they provide a perfect opportunity for integrated terrestrial, uh, terrestrial forest, terrestrial wetland, and aquatic systems to be fully reconstructed or restored. <laughs> 